Great. I would like to start with the land acknowledgement as we would like to begin by respectfully acknowledging that in Houghton, we're gathering on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Atawandaran, Haudenosaunee and Metis people. This sacred land surrounding the Great Lakes has been their home and still is for 15,000 years. We acknowledge and thank the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation for sharing their traditional territory with us. As we gather today on these treaty lands, we have the responsibility to share and care for the land and its gifts in accordance with the Dish with One Spoon One Palm Belt Convenant, a historic peace agree agreement made among indigenous nations that commits to take only what we need, live enough for others and keep the dish clean. We honor and respect the four directions, land, waters, plants, animals and ancestors that walked before us and all of the wonderful elements of creation that exist. So today's uh, theme is um, urban wildlife in the winter. And although I will mention a few scientific facts of how actually uh, animals adapt in the winter, um, the focus is actually how to peacefully and respectfully coexist with wildlife. And we are part of nature, nature is part of us. So um, to me, it is always, um, important that we look um, uh, at all aspects um, and, and we accept, you know, all living organisms and plants and animals as, as part of our home. Um, it's not as easy for a lot of these animals to actually survive the winter, uh, but when you um, actually try and to find out how they do it, it's really, really fascinating. I'll try not to go too much into detail just because I would like to share some very, very interesting um, stories from local Oakville residents and outside of Oakville uh, about their uh, encounters with urban wildlife. Um, but I, I would like to mention a few uh, of these winter adaptations. Uh, as we know, some of them uh, of the animals are not able to find uh, food resources and they decide to, to migrate um, and just change the location for the winter. Others, they're going to dormancy. There are very different states of, of, of dormancy from full hibernation to just partially like slowing down of, of animals metabolism. They go through uh, morphological changes, which means that the um, they, they change form and structure of their organs, um, of the way they look, or they go through uh, physiological changes, which, um, which means how their bodily parts function. So they, they go through some changes in that respect as well. And uh, of course, some behavioral changes. Um, and I would touch a little bit about like the different types of animals because it's again it's uh, it's quite different sometimes. Uh, the in, invertebrates uh, they're called actothermic, which means that they cannot produce their own body heat. Um, so in order for them to survive the winter, um, some of them migrate. As we know, the the perfect example is the monarch butterfly, which is quite a stunning journey. Um, not too many, but I know some of the dragonflies, they, they, they migrate, they just not, of course, they don't travel as, as far as the monarchs, but um, others, they decide to go into a dormant or semi-dormant state. So basically they slow down, um, uh, they, they barely use any energy uh, and conserve their energy and heat. Um, Others, they, they produce some compounds and some sh additional sugars or proteins, and they reduce their water levels in the body. Um, so basically they are tolerant to semi-freezing. Now I'll, I'll, I'll just give some examples. Um, laying eggs, well, spid spiders, they're not, they're uh, anarchids, but um, as well as some uh, other, um, 
uh, dragon, uh, no dragonfly katydids and um, the crickets and the grasshoppers. Um, they all actually end their life cycle, but they actually continue by laying eggs in the fall and they basically continue through the, the egg and can, um, later on the larval stage. Others, they, they huddle up. Um, so um, some of the honeybees, they, for example, they're an amazing example how they decide to huddle up and warm up, stay warm, or just hiding in warm spots. Um, you probably have seen ladybugs uh, in the middle of um, winter and they're, they'll find a way to enter our homes. Uh, but some, some other beetles, they do some cockroaches, they do the same, they, they try to find a warmer spot. Uh, fish, very, very interesting. Um, they, they're ectothermic as well. So they, a lot of them, they remain minimally active to conserve energy. Um, again, like body fluids do not freeze. Uh, some of them migrate, but others, they, they adapt for the, uh, for the environment. Very often when the, the water freezes, there is less oxygen. Um, so a lot of the, uh, of the fish, um, they go towards the inlets when there is more oxygen or um, the pike has a very uh, interesting adaptation. It just goes towards the top, like closer to the, to the ice and um, uh, touches the ice with the snout and makes um, some uh, weak but low like currents. So it stays warm and they're normally solitary, but in the winter you can find them in, in, in pairs or more, just again, like just to, to, do, to make that effort together and to stay warm. Um, so again, like they, they do adopt for basically for two things, the lack of oxygen or hypothermia, um, and again, like some uh, food resources can be scarce, so they, they'll, they'll try to either stay dormant or like very active. So they, they look, they stay warm and they look for more food. Reptiles and amphibians, they're ectothermic again. They either go into dormancy, uh, but they are notorious, especially amphibians for producing these antifreeze uh, compounds. Uh, this, I love that photo, um, of, um, it's basically a, a wood frog, um, and it's, it can stay act completely frozen for weeks, and then after thawing, it comes back to life, which is pretty fascinating. Um, the reptiles, they, they can huddle, um, they're normally not, they're solitary like snakes, but in the middle of the winter, they actually go into something called hibernaculum and they, they just huddle and stay warm. And a lot of uh, the turtles, uh, they, they bury in the mud again, they slow down, they, they can stay for months without actually eating because their metabolism is really slowed down. Birds, um, Besides all these, like the above mentioned, that they they are not they are endothermic, which means that they produce their own heat. So, if they don't migrate, I'm oh, sorry, uh, if they don't migrate, they basically need to stay warm. So they need to find their way. Um, various ways, like some birds, they do expand their brain capacity in the, in the fall, so they can store up and 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 uh, hide their food. Um, they are very mobile, the, the birds that stay during the winter. Um, they sometimes use shivering, uh, but this is again like a way for their bodies to stay warm. Uh, they have strong beaks so they, they can crack bark and nuts because a lot of these animals, they, try, uh, they change their diet, dietary habits in the winter as well. And they have some adaptations for that. Um, they flock huddle together to retain heat. Uh, and of course, they, they're very, very creative in finding their winter shelters. They grow additional feathers for insulation, um, and which is very typical for some of uh, the birds. They, they have a very interesting vascular system in their legs. Sorry, typo, in their legs. Um, and I have some notes here because it's very, um, I thought that uh, very, very interesting. Um, 
So the, the blood leaves in the heart in arteries moving towards the bird's feet. It passes in close proximity to veins returning oxygenated blood back to the heart. Um, so the exchange allows the warmth from the arterial blood to increase the temperature of the blood returning to the veins, which is colder after circulating to the, to the bird's legs. So it's, it's very, very, um, but very interesting, but some squirrels and other mammals, they, they have that, uh, that adaptation as well. Just if we wonder sometimes how their feet are actually not freezing uh, in, the, in the cold. Mammals, they're endothermic. Some of them migrate, some hibernate, some grow thicker fur, um, and uh, some, some have like larger feet to be able to walk in the snow, um, strong leg and, and jaw muscles. Uh, again, they change their diets and eating habits in, in the winter. So if sometimes we think it's, uh, it's a great idea to to feed wildlife, deer with corn or whatever. Uh, we probably haven't done our research or we should be doing our research really well because they apparently, a lot of the animals, they produce different types of digestive, uh, digestive enzymes in the winter months to be able to actually uh, digest a particular type of food. So I read, uh, um, a specific, a specific information about the deer that they would go more for bark and, and twigs like during the winter, not um, as soft food as the leaves and, and the greenery. So their stomachs actually adjust and then adapt and they produce the different types of the enzymes. Very cool. Um, and of course, a lot of them are digging, sheltering, cuddling. So pretty, pretty crazy. Um, life under the snow, we, you may have seen a lot of um, animal tracks in the past week after we got that big snow, but snow acts as an insulator. Sometimes there are labyrinths of tunnels and chambers used by animals to travel, sleep, store their food. Uh, the holes used for animals to enter and exit also as an exhaust vent for the carbon dioxide. So sometimes when we have a very like frequent freezes and fall cycles, that's not ideal. Um, what is interesting is that some of the birds of prey, such as the owls, they can even hear noise under the snow. So they're, they, they, they have an exceptional sense of hearing. So they can actually hear that there are rodents under the snow. So the subnevel zone, this is how it's called, is the ideal for the rodent population. So you may have seen a lot of little animal tracks on the snow. Um, so just because they're, they're pretty happy and they, they to, to be, it's much warmer. It's basically, um, you need 25 centimeters of snow um, to be able to maintain um, a temperature close to zero, although it may be like outside, it may be minus 20, 25 degrees Celsius. Um, and it would still like under the snow, it would just, it would be a great insulator and still not gonna be much colder than, than zero degrees. So, um, we're gonna start, um, I would like to focus on a few, I know we can just talk for hours about, uh, you know, the different types of wildlife that we encounter in our cities. But I would like to start with uh, a few animals that are very common visitors. Um, again, uh, what would be the best practices uh, if, if we have a visitor in our backyard or if we see one uh, on, on our walks outside. Um, so, and I would like to share some real stories from the neighborhood. So coyotes, I know um, they're the largest predator in the, in the area. And although some people are afraid of them and they could be a threat to, to pets and small children, if we don't know how uh, to, what to do, um, they're really, really significant uh, to maintain their ecological balance, um, being the largest top predator in our area. So they keep in check the rodent population. 
So they feed on mice, they may feed on rabbits, birds, other small mammal, uh, mammals, amphibians, and plants. Um, they, um, they actually like crab apples. They, um, they may even eat uh, fur and cedar leaves, uh, blackberries and twigs. So they're not, they're, actually, they're omnivores. So they're very intelligent, very uh, shy. Um, they're highly adaptable to city life. So they're fast runners. They can reach speeds of up to 69 kilometers per hour, which is, which is really, really uh, amazing. Um, so they sometimes mate for life. So they're monogamous. Uh, so they do parenting together. So between the months of January and March, it's their breeding season. So it's very likely that you may see them uh, during the day, although they're nocturnal, uh, but you may see them during the day as well, just because they're really trying to look for food uh, to look after their family. Uh, very well developed sense of smell and hearing. They're very territorial, uh, as I said, especially in the breeding season. Uh, so what to do and not to do uh, if you encounter a coyote. So you need to stay still and never ever run. Uh, as I mentioned, they're very fast runners, so they can easily outrun. And if we start running, they normally think this is like, a, they, they may especially, you know, that instinct for chasing uh, a prey. So never run, make some loud noise and make yourself appear very large. So you may uh, also throw rocks, sticks or other objects to scare, scare them away. Um, you can start backing up slowly, ideally if you can, just uh, facing them without turning your back. As I mentioned, they're generally very shy. Um, they wouldn't really attack you without uh, a reason. Um, so it, it is a misunderstanding um, very often that they'll, they'll attack, you know, small children or... Um, that being said, it is very um, important that we don't um, don't feed them, don't leave any of our pets um, in the backyard, especially during that season, or just walking them without a leash. Um, be prepared if you can carry a whistle or if you have a backpack or something. Um, never ever feed a coyote. Uh, or just leave any type of food in your backyard. And never try, uh, stand between a mother and a pup. They're just trying to protect. Um, again, they, they're no normally very uh, shy. They would try to just stay away from people if they can. It's just this time of the year that um, survival is not easy and finding food is not easy for them, especially in a city where green space uh, is not so... Um, abundant, so it's, it's they're just uh, walking on streets. We see them everywhere. Um, a few things to be aware, and there was a story in Burlington recently that uh, I was uh, reading about. Um, if you see a coyote appearing during the day, and especially if, if you see something unusual in the behavior, such as lack of fur, it may, uh, this the animal may be diseased. There is a very common, um, disease that is called mange in coyotes. Uh, it's associated with um, a, a parasite that is transmitted by a mite that infects the, uh, the individual by burrowing into their skin. So the uh, coyotes, they lose their fur, they become susceptible to other infections um, and, and they become hosts for other pathogens as well. It can spread, but only with uh, contact, uh, but it can spread to pets very, very rarely to humans. But this is why it is important that we actually don't let our uh, pets without a leash, uh, especially during the winter season. So that um, the coyote that appeared during the day, it was showing signs of, um, of that disease. So if you encounter an animal like that, it would be, it would be good to contact the city um, uh, because it, it's a good to keep an eye on, on diseased animals. And it is not very likely to see a coyote just lingering during the day um, or if, if it behaves strangely too, it's always good to 
and you see the animal repeatedly, it's always a good idea to, um, to let the city know. Um, we can just have like, make sure you, you have your questions and your stories at the end. Um, but um, I'm gonna go with the next with foxes. Uh, and this again, they're absolutely beautiful, amazing, smart animals. And I've been very, very lucky to have a fox visitor in my backyard uh, this month. Um, we call it our spirit animal, just because he appeared New Year's Day, then appeared on my birthday, and then on my son's birthday, all mornings at the same time. Um, very interesting, uh, but that's the fox in my backyard. Um, they do not hibernate in winter. They're again, they're omnivores, they're nocturnal, but you see them during the day now. Again, it's their breeding season. They're really desperate to find food. Um, and with the snow cover, it's, it's a little bit more difficult to look for, you know, the rodents. Um, so it, you wouldn't be surprised to see uh, a fox during the day at this time of the day. They're normally solitary animals. Um, they dig underground. So they, people sometimes would complain that there is a lot of digging if there is a fox in the area. Um, they have excellent supersonic, which means that it's um, beyond the human hearing, sense of hearing. Um, so uh, they have some musky smell coming from plants at the base of their tails. Um, they're amazing parents. They show great caring adaptability and intelligence when, intelligence when they're raising their young. Um, and they can, they're good runners. They can run up to 50 kilometers, jump over six feet, and they can even swim. So uh, very athletic. Their tail is about 70% of its head and body length. So very hard to confuse, very easy to identify. They're beautiful, they're gorgeous animals. What to do and not to do. Again, here is the fox sleeping in my planter. Uh, do not approach. I used a very good camera from far away. I was very tempted to go uh, closer, but I gave him space. Uh, do not run or chase, make some loud noise. If you are afraid, uh, if they're not bothering you, just let them be. Um, this fox just napped for a couple of hours before I left the, my backyard. So, um, and I contacted the neighbors. I wanted to make sure everyone's okay. Um, I didn't find out where the den is. I don't, it that doesn't really matter, but as long as everyone is just being respectful, um, Pets should be kept indoors, don't leave any food. Same thing, uh, use humane approaches to scare away or prevent foxes from denning. Um, in that connection, I have a really, really cool story to share. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's here from the West River neighborhood, but um, I live very close by and I have a lot of friends. Uh, so there are a few fox dens and they um, seem to be loving it there. Um, it's it, Most likely it's the proximity to 16 Mile Creek. Foxes, like all wildlife, they do need water sources. So they're trying to stick closer to green space uh, because they find, I guess, more food. Um, this is a friend of mine and this fox decided, this family of foxes actually decided to make a den under their shed. Um, so what happened? You can see in this short video, I hope you're able to see it or give me a sign if there is an issue, but I'm gonna play that short video here. There is no sound, it just, uh,
So they had their pups and they stayed there for the whole uh, winter. Um, the family were just observing. Uh, they did not feed them, which is the right thing to do. We, we don't feed wildlife. Um, I'm even very hesitant to feed birds or if, if, if we do, during the winter, we have to be very watchful, uh, very, very uh, vigilant of uh, if we have different types of, of birds like feeding, sometimes they just carry different diseases. Um, but the family decided just to, uh, to observe. Uh, they let the foxes kind of like use their backyard to raise their young. Uh, all neighbors found uh, some traces of hunting of rabbits and, and rodents, um, but these foxes were seen all over the neighborhood. Once they actually raised uh, their young, they disappeared sometime in the springtime. So it's very common that they they loop the comfort our backyards to dig and 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 try to find food uh, during the winter when they're raising their young. So um, a happy story. Um, they would still complain sometimes in, during the summer um, that the foxes come back and they start digging in the garden, but they don't have any issues with rabbits, I guess. Um, there are a few dens that are known from all residents and no one is just trying to harm them. And they're well informed, well educated, not to domesticate in any way, not even to approach uh, for the foxes to get used to the presence of people and children. So they allow them distance. Uh, they don't leave any food whatsoever. They take good care of their pets. Um, and this is how they coexist peacefully. So I thought that was a very cute uh, story to share. Um, so before I go with raccoons, I have a little game to play with you. So um, for those of you who joined us in December, we did a little bit of a, a quiz. So I'm going to um, do another one and um, we can, all right. Okay, so gonna relaunch the poll. So uh, you should be seeing now on your screens uh, an image of an animal track. And the question is, which animal does this footprint belong to? And you have three options, a raccoon, deer, or fox. So you can just click on the one you believe that is correct. And once everyone's ready, I can share the results with you. All right, a few more seconds, if you would like to participate. All right, so. So most of you uh, thought that was a deer uh, footprint and you're right, this was from a deer. And thank you for Karen for sharing that image. All right. And we're going to do another one. Um, so I have another image here. So which animal do these footprints actually does? It's only one. Does that footprint belong to? All right, a few more seconds. All 
All right, I'm going to share the results with you. So um, very difficult to distinguish between a coyote and a fox. That was a fox one uh, just because I saw it uh, and I knew it was from the fox. Um, coyotes are a slightly larger, but it's very difficult to actually guess from the image without uh, all proper measurements, etc. But very, very close. Um, I'm gonna do another one. Wait. So I have that and I'm gonna stop sharing and then I'm gonna do one more. All right, how about this one? All right, try to guess. Again, this is just a uh, very difficult when we don't have the right um, measurements. When you see it outside, oh, this is big, right? Or this is too small to be a bear wolf. Uh, but I thought it's very interesting just to, to get an idea. And I'm gonna share the results. Um, yeah, so the majority of you thought that was from a bear. It's not from Oakville, but I took that up north and that, that were bear tracks. Um, so a couple more. Um, I have this. Okay, a few more seconds. I think that one's easy. All right, so these were uh, raccoons, um, raccoon footprints, uh, very actually distinct, and we see a lot of these in Oakville. Last ones, I'm going to share these. And the little line in the middle is part of the animal tracks. It's not from the feet, but it's actually, it can give us a hint. All right, and I'm gonna share the results. Uh, these are mouse tracks. Uh, and the the little line in the middle, the, it's it's from the from the tail, and you can see a lot of these. Sometimes they do lead towards a little opening in the snow right now, um, so I'm pretty sure nobody wants to see a lot of these close to close to their homes right now. But if you're if you look uh, around, you will definitely see a lot of the a lot of these little tracks. All right, so thank you for participating in this little. Uh, quiz with with me. Um, I'm, I have a couple more animals before I hear some of your stories with urban wildlife encounters. Uh, raccoons are uh, very interesting. I was just talking with Tori and she mentioned that she rarely sees raccoons in Hamilton, uh, but they see a lot of skunks. Um, there are a lot of, um, uh, not a lot, of the raccoons in I live in in south in central south Oakville, uh, but we do see some. Um, they sleep they they sleep more in the winter than they would normally do, um, and they lose about fifty percent of their body weight, so they're not as chubby I guess in the winter time. Uh, they're omnivores, very opportunistic eaters. Uh, they're nocturnal, that's why we see them a lot playing with our garbage at night. Uh, exceptional sense of touch and you may have uh, heard that uh, people in North America would actually have them as pets before um, 
they discover that they carry uh, rabies, so it's not very safe. They're extremely adaptable uh, to city life. I know they, um, they love living in the big city because they can actually find a lot of food because they can scavenge scavenge every, any type of food and, and even our human food scraps. So they, they'll go for anything. They are very uh, brave. So they would enter their home easily if you let them or if you don't let them sometimes through various openings. Um, so oh, let me just see what's happening with my screen. Oh, there we go. Um, they're excellent climbers. They can fall from 30, uh, 40 feet. Uh, oh, I don't know what, what's that. Uh, 35 to 40 feet uh, without any injury. And it is believed that the black mask actually has, um, has some, you know, helps them deflect glare and improves their night vision. Um, they're that was surprising that um, I found out that the lifespan in the wild is only two to three years. So what to do and not to do. Uh, do not approach or feed raccoons. Again, we don't want to domesticate them. We don't want them to come closer and start like being a nuisance, start digging, try to, to have to raise their young um, babies like close or inside our houses. So, uh, but if you happen to be close to one, make yourself again appear larger and shout, do not hit or corner a raccoon. Uh, if they're inside, open doors and gently just nudge them with a broom or something long that you have. Uh, lots of stories about raccoons entering the houses. And so you just find the raccoon in the middle of the room and you're wondering what to do. Uh, skunks. They huddle in their dens in the cold winter months. They're nocturnal again, omnivores, excellent diggers, and they use their sand glands as a weapon. Um, they send many other warning signs before they spray. We don't, I, I personally don't see a lot of skunks in my area, but what to do and not to do, uh, be calm, gently walk away. Uh, they will usually only attack when cornered or defending their young. Uh, and if they are inside, same thing, open doors and gently nudge them with the broom. Uh, all possums. Um, so the only uh, marsupial for Canada, um, they do slow down again in the winter and they sleep longer in their barrel, burrows. They don't fully hibernate, but they do slow down. They're omnivores and they're scavengers. So they're often considered nature's cleaners. Um, a single opossum may consume uh, up to 4,000 deer ticks in a season. So they help curb diseases um, and they hunt at night. Uh, they know to play, they're known to play dead when sensing dangers uh, and they love trees and areas close to wetlands and creeks. Their pregnancy lasts only for 12, 13 days, and their babies are the size of jelly beans at birth. Uh, they immediately crawl into the mother's pouch, and the mom carries them around on, their, on her back whenever she goes. So they will stay with the mom for about 100 days. So that's pretty, pretty amazing. And um, what to do and not to do. Uh, be calm, gently walk away, same thing. They can hiss, they may appear vicious, but they're not aggressive animals. They're not a threat, but rather beneficial for your garden. So do not leave any food, garbage bean, or fallen fruit on the ground. Uh, but if they're inside again, just gently nudge them. There is a really lovely story that I would like to share with you. And this is from a, a, a wonderful lady uh, her name is Tina Labonte. She's um, from the United States, but she, I'm connected with her. Um, she's one of my nature friends. Um, so um, I would like just to read her little notes about a Sprout. So this is Sprout the Opossum, um, who actually decided to um, be her guest for a while in her backyard. Um, so here is our story. 
I was doing some laundry one afternoon when I looked out the window and was shocked to see an opossum. Shocked because it was the middle of the day and shocked at how cute it was. I had never seen one in good lightning before. I ran and got my camera while he pottered around the yard and he could not care less about me and he let me get close to take pictures. So then one night he showed up um, and he looked like he had been nearly scalped. If it was a coyote or bobcat that got him, they would have eaten him though. So I'm pretty sure it was a dog attack. His wounds were gruesome. I felt bad that um, could be humans that were at the blame for his injury. So I decided to offer him water while he was healing um, and if he was going to heal. Over the months, I offered him food and water uh, and he didn't always take the food, but nearly every time he drank water. Um, so I was relieved when I couldn't see any scabs anymore and knew that he was going to be just fine. I still leave water out for him and he occasionally will stop by. Um, and uh, I caught him one morning carrying a bunch of leaves with his tail. Um, and I think he hangs out in the corner of the yard, but there are a whole bunch of blackberries there, so I can't really know for sure. And he's still a wild animal, and I've never tried to pet him or anything. But his resilience and strength of character just made me root for him so much. I still see him in the yard. I actually saw him four days ago. And, um, and the other picture is his uh, female friend. So. Um, I thought that was a very cute and very inspiring story of uh, actually what we can do to help sometimes without being, without killing with kindness, basically, without being too intrusive. Uh, Sprout is doing okay. Uh, he's actually popular on social media now. Uh, Tina posted all these pictures. People are totally in love with Sprout. Um, so what we can do, this is an ex exception, I guess, when we can help animals, um, but not actually really try to, to get too close, feed them, pat them, domesticate them, or the other way around, like, oh, he's injured, I don't want him, just get out of here. So a very, very touching, a very beautiful, very inspiring story of how we can actually peacefully coexist, how we can be friends with, with animals. Yeah. So that was from me, uh, and we have some time. I would love to hear um, your stories, if you have, or your questions, of course, if you have encountered any wildlife, especially in the winter months. Um, what is your takeaway? How do you deal with that? Have you ever ha been threatened, or how do you feel about going on a walk in the winter? and encountering one of the larger animals we see. So happy to hear. And Tori, do we have any questions actually in the chat 